In 2010, the U.S. Navy's Naval Surface Warfare Center conducted a secret study aimed at fielding a flying submarine, or submersible aircraft as they put it, that could ferry the Navy's most elite special operators, the Navy SEALs, into and out of the fight under cover of not only darkness, but the sea itself. Let's dive into this flying submarine concept and talk about where it may have gone. I'm Alex Hollings, and this is Air Power. America's Special Operations Forces use a wide variety of vehicles to conduct their covert operations, but few are as dramatic as the Navy's recent efforts to field a flying submarine that could ferry operators into and out of the battle space both quickly and stealthily. But I want to be clear right up front that to date, there is no evidence to suggest that such a platform is already in operation. But Navy documents from 2010, which were first revealed by Brett Tingley over at the War Zone in 2021, clearly show that not only was the branch seriously investigating this concept, but they even concluded that the idea was entirely feasible with technology that was already around in 2010. Now, the authors of this 102-page study were actually on loan from the UK Ministry of Defense, and they certainly had the credentials for the job. Jonathan Eastgate earned a bachelor's degree in aeronautical engineering before going on to earn a master's in marine engineering and taking a job with the UK Ministry of Defense as a graduate engineer and later an analyst. And his partner in crime for this study, Rick Goddard, holds master's degrees in both naval architecture with a focus on submarine design and aerospace engineering, before going on to work as a naval architect for the UK Ministry of Defense and continuing his naval architecture work into the private sector. And I'll start by quoting Goddard and Eastgate about how valuable a flying submarine could be to the US Navy. The submersible aircraft study combines the speed and range of an airborne platform with the stealth of an underwater vehicle by developing a vessel that can both fly and submerge. But could Navy SEALs and other special operations units be operating stealthy flying submarines already? Truth be told, it seems pretty unlikely to me, but based on the findings published in this 102-page report, I can honestly tell you that if they aren't already, it's just a matter of time before this flying submarine concept really does come to fruition. But in order to really appreciate how a flying submarine could benefit the Navy SEALs, we need to understand the platforms the SEALs currently use to get them into and out of a fight without being detected. Today, the U.S. Navy operates a number of submersible vehicles for these sorts of clandestine infiltration and exfiltration operations, alongside a number of other mission sets. These SEAL Delivery Vehicles, or SDVs, have come in at least two operational forms to date. The Mark 8 SEAL Delivery Vehicle, or SDV, can be used to transport SEALs underwater. Whereas the now-retired Mark 9 could also carry two Mark 31 or Mark 37 torpedoes to allow Navy SEALs to take down surface vessels all on their own. And there are also at least two new SEAL delivery vehicles, or SDVs, already headed for operational service. The Mark 11 Shallow Water Combat Submersible, or SWCS, is slated to replace the Mark 8, and the more broadly capable Dry Combat Submersible is expected to offer even greater capability. Now, in order to really understand the value that these vehicles offer, we reached out to a few Navy SEALs who explained that not all SEALs operate regularly from SDVs. In fact, they tend to have specialized SEAL delivery vehicle teams. We also spoke to these SEALs about the value these systems provide, but I want to warn you ahead of time that they asked not to have their names included in our final story. I'll quote one now. SDVs? aren't sexy. They're uncomfortable and a lot of work, but they fill a critical and unique capability. The guys that do that get to work with the SDVs are a strategic national asset. 
But despite all the capability offered by these submersible platforms, they also come with some significant setbacks. The Mark 8 SDV and its successor, the Mark 11, are both what we call wet submersibles, meaning the four seals they can carry are exposed to the water they're traveling through. Imagine driving an underwater convertible. The wet submersible design does reduce weight and power requirements, but it limits how long seals can travel in cold water before they start to suffer physically adverse effects. And that's a huge issue, not just for the four seals that are being ferried into and out of the fight, but for the two seal crew members on the SDVs that are tasked with its operation. They have to cover the same distance twice while submerged. And the Mark 8 is also really limited when it comes to range. Once deployed, the Mark 8 SDV can only carry a team of four SEALs about 18 miles while submerged. And that obviously means having to have a launching vessel fairly close to shore. And while the exact performance specs for the Mark 11 haven't been released yet, we do know that it's about 12 inches longer and about 4,000 pounds heavier. It's expected to come with an increase in operational range, but that'll probably be adding a few miles rather than adding a zero to the end of that 18 miles. The much larger Dry Combat Submersible, or DCS, can also carry two crew members as well as eight SEALs, twice that of the Mark 8 or 11. And because the crew compartment is dry, its operational range isn't limited by the survivability of its occupants in cold water. But because of the limitations of its lithium-ion batteries, it's limited to around 60 nautical miles, or 69 miles in range. And remember, you have to cut that in half for deliveries and exfills. And that's why it's in discussions about operational range that a flying submersible's value becomes most evident. You could cover a vast distance using conventional aviation propulsion systems before landing and submerging, transitioning to battery power only to cover the final few miles to the target while benefiting from the inherent stealth of a submersible. And believe it or not, the idea of combining submarines and aircraft has really been around as long as submarines and aircraft. The British sank one of their M-Class submarines before World War II started when they attempted to add an aircraft hangar to it. The French carried foldable planes in their submarine cruisers in the 1930s, and in the 1950s, the U.S. developed the AN-1 submarine aircraft carrier design capable of carrying eight fighters within its submersible hull. Now, all of these efforts found their way to the scrap heap for one reason or another, and even this idea for a flying SEAL delivery vehicle isn't without some significant challenges to overcome. Aircraft are inherently low density because weight is a constant concern for airborne platforms. Submarines, on the other hand, are incredibly dense, as dense as the water that they're submerged in. Airplane fuselages are designed with weight in mind and could never survive the pressure of being completely submerged in, say, 100 feet of water, whereas submarines have incredibly strong hulls to withstand that pressure and are just way too heavy to fly. And this is where that submersible aircraft concept design study by Rick Goddard and Jonathan Eastgate comes in. They aimed to determine the feasibility of an aircraft that could easily transition from flight to operating on the surface of the water and then operating below the surface with these exact challenges in mind. The impetus behind the concept, of course, was finding a way to get special operations troops into and out of contested areas under a shroud of secrecy. In practice, the premise really just takes the submarine aircraft carrier concept and removes the carrier. Just like seaplanes were meant to eliminate an aircraft's reliance on airstrips, flying submarines could operate secretly in any maritime environment and without a submersible aircraft carrier or launching vessel nearby to support them. It was with this premise in mind that DARPA published a request for designs in 2008, outlining a list of requirements such a flying submarine would need to be able to meet in order to be an effective weapon in a near-peer conflict. So in 2010, when the Navy kicked off their own study into a flying submersible, they used DARPA's outlined requirements, or concept of operations as they're known. I'll run through those defined requirements now. The first and most obvious is that this flying submarine needs to be able to be deployed from existing Navy or other auxiliary platforms. 
It needs to be able to take off and land unassisted from the surface of the water. It needs an in-flight range of 400 miles or more. And it needs to be able to transit at least 12 miles while submerged and loiter for up to 72 hours while avoiding detection. And maybe most important of all, it needs to be able to cover those same distances, 12 miles beneath the waves and 400 in the sky on the way back as well. Now, as I mentioned, the Navy Special Warfare Center and Office of Naval Research used these same requirements for their study, but in order to emphasize real-world applications, they further added the requirements that the vehicle must be fully submerged during that 72-hour loiter time and must be able to complete the entirety of its mission without refueling. The study determined that a flying wing blended body design was best suited for managing the rigors of both flight and operating beneath the surface of the water. So the Navy set about creating two potential flying submarine designs that do look similar, but are slightly different in approach to solving the litany of challenges before them. The first design, dubbed Variant 1, came with a 92-foot wingspan, or just about two F-22 Raptors wing-to-wing. But at just 37,000 pounds, it would be significantly lighter than just one F-22 before adding any fuel or ordnance. The design was 36 feet long and could carry a 750-pound Navy SEAL payload, while cruising at speeds of around 200 miles per hour when airborne. The second design, logically called Variant 2, was pretty similar, but it boasted a larger 109-foot wingspan, or just a bit bigger than a U-2 spy plane, as well as a shorter overall length of about 34 feet. Variant 2 offered the same speed and payload capabilities, despite having a slightly higher overall weight of 39,000 pounds. Both designs leverage multiple watertight compartments, keeping a two-person crew separate from the personnel compartments that would carry Navy SEAL operators. Variant 1 included a single large personnel compartment capable of carrying six Navy SEALs, while Variant 2 used two smaller personnel compartments that could each hold three. In both designs, the wings would carry fuel in a membrane that would allow any unoccupied space in the wings to be flooded with seawater while this flying submarine was submerged. Likewise, the personnel compartments were intended to be free flooding when the vehicle was underwater. These aircraft would use two turbofan motors to propel the vehicle while in flight and while on the surface of the water, but they would then seal over using torpedo-style doors when submerged to protect them from exposure to seawater. Submerged propulsion would be managed by a drop-down azimuthing pod with electric motor, capable of maintaining a speed of just about six knots or so. Both variants of this flying submarine concept were to operate at depths of around 30 meters, or just shy of 100 feet, and be able to take off and land on specially designed inflatable rafts. Now, the overall specs associated with Variant 1 and Variant 2 designs were pretty similar, but they differed far more when it came to the arrangement of their respective crew compartments. In both designs, the quarters were very cramped, so the team compared the internal volume of the crewed cockpit to the long-duration flying route in Voyager, the first aircraft to fly around the world without stopping, and the Apollo capsule that brought astronauts home from the moon. Both designs ultimately ended up offering about 180 cubic feet of space for two pilots or crew members during missions that could last up to 84 hours in duration. Now, that was far shy of the 216 cubic feet allowed by the Apollo capsule, but that capsule was made for longer 144-hour operations and had a third occupant. It was much more than the 35 cubic feet offered by the Voyager for a 216-hour flight. And based on those comparisons, 180 cubic feet seemed pretty feasible, even if it probably wouldn't be all that comfortable. In Variant 1, the personnel compartment for special operators was placed forward of the cockpit, as these compartments would flood during submerged operation, placing the pressurized cabin as close to the vehicle's center of gravity as possible. In this configuration, the vehicle's batteries are stored on either side of the personnel compartment, in line with the turbofan engines. 
Special operators would deploy through a large hatch on the top of the vehicle near an equipment locker. Both turbofan engines would be placed far to the rear and as close to the center line of the vehicle as the cabin would permit. Though the study points out that analysis needed to be done regarding performance during a single engine failure. If the engines were mounted too far apart and one were to fail, it could place this flying submarine into an unrecoverable flat spin, a problem that cost the Navy as many as 40 F-14 Tomcats during its service life. This arrangement resulted in an exterior appearance that was more triangular in shape than its alternative, explaining its slightly longer dimensions. Variant 2, on the other hand, sought an even lower profile along the vehicle's centerline, accomplished by distributing equipment and personnel across a wider area. As I mentioned before, the personnel compartment carrying special operators would be split in two, placing three operators on each side of the pressurized cabin in reclined chairs to maximize headroom while minimizing height. But overall placement of the turbofan engines, ballast tanks, air pressure systems, and some of the other components were carried over from Variant 1. The batteries in the Variant 2 design were placed ahead of the pressurized cabin and between the personnel compartments. Operators would again exit through hatches on the top of the vehicle, but would have to swim to its rear to grab their bags, scooters, and other mission-specific equipment out of a gear locker. The result is a shorter, wider exterior design with a slightly lower centerline, and this arrangement proved heavier due to its added width and the associated fairing involved. Okay, so how would any of this actually work, though? Well, according to DARPA's concept of operations and the conclusions drawn by the Navy study, it might play out something like this. The vehicle would be deployed by any surface vessel large enough to carry it and equipped to place it in the water. Two vehicle operators, or pilots, would enter the pressurized crew compartment and begin their pre-flight checks as the Navy SEALs or whatever other special operations divers donned their equipment and stored the rest of their gear in the vehicle's locker. This flying submarine would then be placed on the water atop two specialized inflatable floats that would eliminate the suction effect a hull can have on the water's surface. Its two turbofan engines would propel the vehicle to 100 knots, at which point this unusual aircraft and everyone on board would take to the sky. Once airborne, a lightweight fly-by-wire control system fed through a flight control computer would manage the aircraft's twin flap control surfaces that allowed roll-independent yaw control, thus eliminating the need for a vertical tail. The vehicle would remain airborne until it was about 12 nautical miles from shore, which is the conventional limit of territorial waters in terms of international law. In other words, even if someone were to spot the aircraft flying along its route, it would be seen flying over international waters. Using deployable floats, the flying submarine would land on the surface of the water, and if necessary, the vehicle could then go even further on the surface of the ocean. It would turn by modulating the output of the turbofan engines independently. When it came time to submerge, it would close the torpedo tube-style doors around the turbofan engines and deflate those floats. It would then fill its ballast tanks, submerging the vehicle and flooding all compartments except for that pressurized cabin. The seals inside, wearing wetsuits and completely submerged in water, would draw breath from the same high-pressure air system that kept the cabin pressurized and that would refill the vehicle's floats. Based on industry capabilities in 2010, the study posits that storing more than enough air to meet all operational requirements internally would be entirely feasible, so there wouldn't be any need for equipment to refill those air tanks while underway. The vehicle would then deploy its underwater propulsion pod, using an electric motor to propel it forward and a combination of the motor's orientation and the vehicle's flight control surfaces for maneuvering. I'll go ahead and quote the report again. It is envisaged that the pilot will be assisted by a flight control system, acting between the manual yoke inputs and the final flap deflections, and that this system would be able to deal with the smaller deflections needed for underwater maneuvering. This flying submarine, now more submarine than airplane, would approach the shore fully submerged, opening its hatches and deploying the combat divers while deep enough to avoid detection. Once out of the vehicle, the divers would grab their gear from the equipment locker and travel on using submersible scooters or by just swimming to shore. 
The special operators would then have 72 hours to conduct whatever clandestine operations in enemy territory that they needed, while the vehicle's two pilots remained on board and fully submerged. Once the special operations team completed their mission, they would return to the water, swimming back to the vessel and re-entering again while fully submerged, reconnecting to its onboard air supply while they did at which point the pilots would drive the vehicle back into international waters before surfacing once again, inflating the floats, and taking off to fly back to the ship that deployed it or to a different designated recovery point. After the Navy tested this concept using a scale model, the report concluded that, quote, feasible vehicle concepts can be generated using current technology and materials to design and build a real special operations flying submarine. But, as far as the public is aware, that's the end of this story. Now again, to be perfectly clear, it's impossible to say if this study resulted in further development of such a flying submarine, or if it was just quietly shelved alongside other exotic but seemingly feasible programs. It is, after all, important to remember that the U.S. was not particularly concerned with great power competition or near-peer conflict back in 2010. This is, after all, one year before F-22 Raptor production halted after just 186 fighters were delivered out of 750 ordered. To be frank, America's defense apparatus was funding combat operations in multiple theaters against opponents with no notable air or sea power, so efforts to field a stealthy or otherwise highly advanced platform for either environment was just not really a priority. It's possible, however, that development continued on the flying submarine concept at low volume and scale. And to be honest, the U.S. may even have some of these platforms in service today. After all, the F-117 Nighthawk started flying in 1981, but wasn't revealed to the public until 1988. Today, America has successfully flown a technology demonstrator for its Next Generation Air Dominance Program, assembled a number of B-21 Raiders, and regularly operates the highly secretive RQ-180, all without most of us getting a good look at any of them. It stands to reason that there could be other flying black triangle programs that we remain entirely in the dark about. But to be clear here, the Navy may have concluded that it was feasible to build a flying submarine, but that doesn't mean that the Navy felt it was practical. The truth is, if there is such a vehicle in service today, we probably won't know about it for some time to come. And if there isn't, well, the authors of this report had one interesting bit of advice for future endeavors. According to them, the real secret is approaching this problem with the intention of building a submersible aircraft rather than a flying submarine, because apparently planes do better underwater than submarines do above it. And with that unusual and maybe not all that handy piece of advice, we will end yet another edition of Air Power from Sandbox News. I'm Alex Hollings. Make sure you swing by sandboxnews.com today and every day for all the latest in news, entertainment, and motivation from all around the force. If you got anything out of today's video, make sure to click like and subscribe down below and leave me a comment so I know what I should cover next. And of course, don't forget to tap on that bell icon so you never miss a drop from Sandbox News.